One man blasphemes God's name every day. His neighbor prays to God in the name of Jesus Christ every day. And when the storm comes, both of their homes are taken out. The righteous and the wicked are caught up in these things together. So whatever we say about disasters must hold true both for the righteous and for the wicked. Welcome to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith. I'm David Pick. I'm glad you're with us today. And Colin, we often struggle to understand why God allows disaster to happen to innocent and righteous people. Yeah, that's right. And I think that the default of the human heart is for us to think that, you know, good happens to the good and bad happens to the bad. Very simply, reading the Bible, that doesn't hold up. You have Job, the most righteous man on the face of the earth, and terrible tragedy comes to him. You have the Son of God who committed no sin, and look at how he suffered. So the Bible clearly is saying to us, it ain't as simple as that. And we need an understanding of suffering in this life and of disasters in this world that takes seriously the fact that both the righteous and the wicked also suffer and suffer together in a fallen world. And Micah speaks to this, and we're going to look at that in the Scripture together today. It's really important. Otherwise, I I find as a pastor there are so many people who are saying, well, now, is God punishing me for this? And so forth and so on. And uh, there's all kinds of confusion about how we are to interpret suffering in this world. Well, the Bible's going to be our light and our guide to something where we really need the truth and the wisdom of God. So join us today, if you can, in the book of Micah, chapter 1, as we begin the message, The God Who Brings Disaster. Here's Colin. Now, the book of Micah begins with a terrifying scene. In verse 3, God rises up from his dwelling place and he comes down to the earth. The reason that is given for God's coming down in this way is that he has a case against the peoples of the earth. Verse 2, he is bringing charges against a rebellious world. Verse 4 describes the sheer terror of what happens. It really is like a scene from a disaster movie. Micah says the mountains melt with wax, like wax beneath the Lord. The valleys split apart. I was trying to think what Steven Spielberg would do if he was depicting this in uh, the form of film. The special effects department would have an extraordinary time with this. Uh, Think of this picture. Imagine the mountains and they're like wax melting away, just falling, crumbling, eroding. And valleys that are splitting apart, revealing great chasms beneath uh, the earth. Now, Micah was a brilliant communicator. He uses the drama of these vivid pictures to put across his message. But the real punch of what he has to say comes in verse 5. You see, when Micah uh, opened his uh, prophecy here, saying, Listen, O earth, and all that is in it, the Lord is coming in judgment, his audience would have been nodding their heads in quiet agreement. Amen, amen, they would say. Judgment day is coming. God is going to deal with his enemies. The Assyrians really have it coming to them. Their mountains are going to melt like wax. Their valleys are going to split apart. The Lord will come from his dwelling place. Lord, come quickly, judge the earth, reign in righteousness. May the Lord be praised forever. Amen and amen. You see, that's what the audience would be thinking, just like an evangelical audience whenever the subject of judgment is addressed today. But then look at what Micah says in verse 5. All this is because of Jacob's transgression. Sorry, Micah, what did you say? I said... All this is because of Jacob's transgression. This is because of the sins of the house of Israel. Now, Jacob and Israel are ways of speaking about God's people in the Old Testament. They saw themselves as the true believers, the light of the world, the people who carried the name of God in the world. And Micah says, you you need to realize it's not the Assyrian mountains that God's going to melt. It's not the valleys of our enemies that God is going to split apart. It's our mountains. 
It's our valleys that are going to be destroyed. Now, talk about a knockout punch. I mean, this is a left hook landed straight on the jaw. Micah, you cannot be serious. But Micah is deadly serious. This is the word of the Lord. You want to know what God is saying? He continues, verse 6, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken to pieces. In other words, he's saying, this disaster that I'm talking about, it's coming on you. Now, of course, this is exactly what happened during Micah's uh, lifetime. Samaria in the year 722 BC was overrun. The Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom of Samaria, marked there in green. The great war machine of Assyria trundled over the valleys and indeed the mountains, bringing absolute devastation to the entire country. Now, notice Micah's response to his own message. He says, verse 8, because of this, I will weep. I will weep. Now, here is a man with the word of God, and he also has the heart of God. He knows that he cannot change the course of events in Samaria. In fact, he says, verse 9, that the wounds of the northern kingdom are incurable. Samaria's resistance to the Lord has reached the point of no return. So Micah cannot change the course of these events, but his tears show that he really cares. And there may be times in your life just like that. Things reach a point where they cannot continue as they are. You have to tell a son or a daughter to leave home. You have to make an intervention in the life of somebody that you dearly love. The day of reckoning has come. And it tears you apart, but you cannot avoid it. And Micah says, what you will experience, because of this, I will weep and wail. Notice how he continues, verse 10. Tell it not in Gath. Now, Gath was one of the five main cities that belonged to the Philistines. Philistines, of course, being the longtime enemies of God's people. Goliath, the giant Goliath, he came from the town of Gath. And this phrase, tell it not in Gath, was used first by King David at the time when Saul died on the field of battle. And at the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 1, uh, we're told that David took up this lament about Saul and Jonathan, that the glory of Israel, Israel's king, had been slain on the heights and lies slain, and the mighty have fallen. And then David says through tears, tell it not in Gath. Don't proclaim it in the streets of Ashkelon. Don't let the Philistines be glad. In other words, he knows that one of the worst aspects of this disaster is that the enemies of God's people will rejoice in the downfall of Saul, the king among them. And it's true, don't expect sympathy from your enemies when disaster comes. The world's press has not been entirely sympathetic to the disaster that has befallen our country. Some who despise our country seem to have found a certain strange and perverse satisfaction in our troubles. And that is what David was talking about when Saul died and Micah takes up his well-known phrase, tell it not in Gath, knowing that the enemies of God's people will rejoice when they come into trouble. He says, tell it not in Gath. Then Micah gives us a list of towns that will be caught up in this great disaster. These are all little local areas. Uh, in verse 10, he speaks about Beth Opera, Shafir, uh, then Zanan, Beth Ezel, Marath, and Lachish. And if you look down to verse 14, you'll see there that he includes his own little hometown that we referred to last time, Moresheth. That must have been particularly painful for Micah to think about his own little hometown being caught up in this terrible disaster that would come from the Lord. Now, Micah uses the names of these towns to communicate his message. The name uh, Opera 
in Beth Opera sounds like the Hebrew word for dust. And so he says, let Beth Opera roll in the dust. The word shafir sounds like the Hebrew word for beautiful. And Micah is saying, in effect, uh, shafir ain't going to be beautiful for too much longer. Uh, Zainan sounds like the Hebrew word for exit. And uh, he's saying the problem for this city will be it's under siege. So nobody will be exiting from it. So to get the impact, what you need to do is to think about the places that are our places. And it would sound something like this. It'll be no go in Chicago. There'll be a reeling in Wheeling. There'll be out of time in Palatine. There'll be big pains in Des Plaines. It'll turn out the lights in Arlington Heights. Now, you see, we smile because that kind of pun seems very shallow and trivial in our culture. But it really was a very common way to communicate in ancient times. And the impact of this on uh, Micah's first audience would be to say, wow, he's talking about here. He's talking about where I live. He's talking about something that will touch me. Now, verse 12 really is the key statement in this whole chapter. And this is what I want us to focus our attention for the rest of our time this morning. Verse 12. Those who live in Maroth writhe in pain, waiting for relief, because disaster has come from the Lord, even to the gate of Jerusalem. I want to focus in on these words. Disaster has come from the Lord. Now, this raises the very important question, how should we think about great disasters today? How should you think about personal loss, financial crises, breakdowns in health? See, all of these things happen in the lives of God's children. What are we to say about the disasters that come into the lives of those who are encircled in God's covenant love? And what are we to say, indeed, about natural disasters that come on the earth? You cannot separate these two questions. Because every time a natural disaster comes, the righteous and the wicked are caught up in it together. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about the fall of Samaria in 722 BC, or the Second World War, or the terrorist attack on 9-11, or the tsunami in Indonesia and Sri Lanka, or the hurricane that has affected New Orleans. The righteous and the wicked are always caught up in these things together. Think of it. One man blasphemes God's name every day. His neighbor prays to God in the name of Jesus Christ every day. And when the storm comes, both of their homes are taken out. The righteous and the wicked are caught up in these things together. So whatever we say about disasters must hold true both for the righteous and for the wicked. Both for God's enemies and for his children. You're listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith and our message called The God Who Brings Disaster. It's part of our series, Close Encounters with the Living God. And if you ever miss one of the series, you can always catch up or go back and listen again online at our website, openthebible.org.uk. Back to the message now. We're in Micah chapter 1. Here's Colin. Now, I want to suggest to you three things that we should do when disaster comes. We're talking particularly this morning about our faith and how we respond as Christian believers with regards to our faith in such times as these. Three things. Number one, we must affirm that God is in control of disasters. We must affirm that God is in control of disasters. Now, this isn't easy. There are a hundred questions, I'm sure, that come quickly to your mind as they do to mine as soon as we come to this statement of truth. In fact, it is so difficult to face some of the questions that arise from affirming that God is in control of disasters, that some Christians have felt that it would be better 
to keep God at a distance from disasters altogether. Now, there was a movement that began back in the 18th century called deism, deism. And the deists believed that God created the world, but then that he stands back from the world and leaves it to run by its own devices. The deists taught, and indeed still do, that rather like a watchmaker, God made the world like a watch, and winding it up, as it were, he left it to run by its own mechanism without any further interference. He walked away and left it to its own devices for better or for worse. In other words, that God is at a distance. And therefore, if something good happens to you, there's no reason to thank him for it. And if something bad happens to you, there's no reason to blame him for it. That God is at a distance both from the blessings and the disasters of life. That he was simply the inventor of the great machine called the cosmos that he created. And then he's put us in it. And here we are to uh, work out our own experiences, which will essentially be a matter of random chance in this created universe. So for the deist, there, is no, there are no miracles. There can be no salvation, because by definition, salvation is an intervention of God. There can be no prayer, uh, because that would involve God hearing and answering and intervening. No, all you really have is yourself. Now, anyone who knows the Bible will see that deism is quite different from Christianity. The Bible makes it clear that the Creator is always involved with His creation, that He directs and reigns, that He rules and intervenes. He hears and answers prayer. He sends His Son into the world. He opens blind eyes and deaf ears and raises those who are spiritually dead. So no one who believes the Bible will embrace deism. But some Christians want to go halfway there. They want to say that God is in control of the good, but not of the bad. That his hand is seen in the good things of life, but they don't want his hand in any way associated with something that is bad. Now, here's the problem with that. If God is in control of the good only, who is in control of the bad? And if the bad is outside of God's control then the bad is actually greater than God because it's beyond his ability to control it, and then we're in real trouble. A God who is not sovereign over evil would leave evil sovereign over us. And that leaves us in a world where chaos reigns and where disaster rules. If God is not in control of all things, then we are adrift on the sea of chance. The Bible, therefore, brings us the good news that God is in control even of the disasters of our lives. Let me give you scripture for that. First, Micah chapter 1 and verse 12, right where we are, where he speaks of the disaster that comes from the Lord. It's not coming through another hand apart from his. Psalm 107 You might like to look through verses 25 to 30 that speak specifically of the God who stirs up the storm. Some people went down to sea in ships, the psalmist writes, and they saw the works of the Lord, for he spoke and stirred up the tempest and lifted high the waves. And then he pictures this boat mounting up to the heavens and the panic as the sailors are reeling like drunken men, it says, at their wit's end, and they call out to God. And then God stills the storm. But you see, the Bible attributes both the raising of the storm and the stilling of the storm to the same hand of God. You find the same, of course, in the book of Jonah, chapter 1 and verse 4. It was the Lord who sent a great wind on the sea such a violent storm that the ship threatened to break up. But perhaps the greatest testimony to the good and the bad coming from the hand of God comes from uh, Job himself, the righteous man in the Old Testament, who experienced such terrible loss in a terrorist attack and a natural disaster we saw last time on the same day. 
And in Job chapter 2 and verse 10, this is what Job says in response. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? So I've affirmed that, that good has come to me through the hand of God. Here's trouble now. Shall I not accept that too and submit to it from the hand of God? Now, we know from the book of Job that Satan's hand was behind what Job suffered But the Bible will never allow us for one moment to think that Satan operates as some kind of free agent. Martin Luther said, and uh, and I found this profoundly helpful. He said, even the devil is God's devil. His point was that Satan's best effort to destroy God's work always ends up contributing to its growth. That's the ultimate frustration for the evil one. He can never ultimately accomplish his own ends. So now the mystery of God's sovereignty leaves us with many, many questions. But I would far rather live with these unanswered questions than with the alternative, which would be that the storms of life are somehow outside of God's control. Nothing happens to you or to me except it passes through the hand of a sovereign God. The circumstances in your life may be very far from what you would like them to be right now, but they are under the control of God. And that's the first thing you need to know in times of disaster. We must affirm that God is in control of disasters. The bedrock of Christian faith. It's so important for us to remember that whatever our circumstances are, they may not be under our control, but they are always under God's control, even in times of disaster. You're listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith and our message called The God Who Brings Disaster, part of our series, Close Encounters with the Living God. There is something about times of difficulty and disaster. Often we can look back and realise that we have experienced God in a new way. That's what happened in Micah's day. Israel's faith had gone soft and the nation came to the brink of disaster. And at that critical moment, Micah's voice cut through the spiritual fog and led the nation to a new encounter with God. The same can be true for you. If you're feeling spiritually flat, spending time in the book of Micah and in this series can give you a new vision of what God wants from you. The whole series will be broadcast in the coming days, and after that we'll still be available to listen to free on our website and also available as a podcast. Our website address is openthebible.org.uk and the podcast is available on your regular podcasting site by searching for Open the Bible UK or by following the link from our website. While you're looking at our website, you'll also find Open the Bible Daily, a series of short two to three minute daily reflections based on Pastor Colin Smith's teaching and read in the UK by Sue McLeish. Open the Bible is supported entirely by our listeners, people just like you. And if that's something you've been considering doing, we have an offer for you this month to say thank you for your support. If you're able to set up a new payment to the work of Open the Bible in the amount of £5 per month or more, this month we'd love to thank you by sending you Pastor Colin's new book, Flying Through the Bible. Colin, why did you use the flying metaphor to describe this book? Well, suppose you were making a visit to the Grand Canyon and exploring it for the first time. I mean, I guess you could hike down and you'd get a sense of the depth of the canyon. You could drive around the rim. You'd get a sense of uh, the length of it. But perhaps the best way to get an overall sense of the vastness and beauty of the Grand Canyon would be to take a flight over it. Now, when it comes to the Bible, to get a high altitude overview of what the Bible story is all about seems to me to be the best place to begin. The Bible really is one story. It begins in a garden, it ends in a city, and all the way through it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And fly through the Bible is kind of cookies on the bottom shelf, to uh, change the analogy. It gives an overall picture, an introduction to the scripture that I hope will help and encourage people to want to explore more when they get on the ground. 
Well, we'd love to send you a free copy of Colin's book, Fly Through the Bible, to say thank you for setting up a new donation to the work of Open the Bible this month in the amount of £5 per month or more. Full details of this offer are on our website, openthebible.org.uk. For Pastor Colin Smith and Open the Bible, I'm David Pick, and I hope you'll come and join us again soon. You know that God's in charge of the good things that happen in life, but what about the bad? Find out next time on Open the Bible.